Hey everyone, and welcome to Liquid Liner Notes, a podcast that brings you interviews from the beverage and music industries. I'm your host, Danny, aka Hip Hops on Instagram. For this week's episode, I have Marty Scott, the barrel program manager of Revolution Brewing, Chicago's largest independently owned craft brewery and founder of Barrel Ponics, a consulting firm on all things wood aging. Marty, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Danny. And I, I, I want to give a shout out before we start this interview to Ryan and Craig of ABV Chicago and Alexi of Heavy Hops because they had really good interviews with you. And uh, it made my job pretty easy to, to do some research. So I just wanted to shout those guys out um, just in case they hear this. All right. So first, I want to start off with how you became interested in craft beverage. Yeah. Um, I was in college at the time at Eastern Illinois University in uh, the early aughts. And I got a job at the only liquor store in the county um, that had craft and import um, beer selections. And uh, you know the uh, the owners were uh, the black sheep uh, nephews of former Illinois Governor Jim Edgar. Oh. Uh, Jed and Todd Edgar ran a couple of Alice in Wonderland theme. Um, businesses. One was a bar called Mad Hatter's that I lived above, now closed, sadly. Uh, and in the same parking lot, uh, they had the Rabbit Hole, which was their liquor store and head shop and little uh, rinky dink convenience mart. That's pretty funny. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't have a, a real like computing cash register. Uh, we had to take everything down by hand. So, like, if, if you came up to the counter with, you know, a 30 rack of Keystone, and you got you know uh, you know three packs of P Funks or Parliament Lights, uh, and a handle of Barton's coconut vodka. You know I'd, you'd have to write all that down on a legal pad, and then calculate the tax and everything, uh, make the change, uh, and that was the transaction. And uh, if at the end of the night your book was clean and the register was was balanced, um, you know sometimes they reward me. Uh, with a, a 750 of Vesmol triple or something like that. And they were um, really enthusiastic about expanding my horizons. Um, you know, we used to, you know, I, I'd go drop off the receipts at the end of the night. You know, the money would go in the safe at the liquor store and the receipts would go over to the bar that was still open. Um, and, uh, you know, they'd sit me down and they'd make me suffer through Sierra Nevada pale ale, which was too bitter for me at the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, they'd be rolling and smoking hand-rolled cigarettes, and they'd uh, be spinning Frank Zappa vinyls, um, giving me sips of scotch that I couldn't stand. <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was this strange kind of, um, kind of a highbrow um, bunch of miscreants, really. Uh, they were, they were a, a cool couple of guys, uh, and they, they turned me on... Um, to a lot of the finer things that I enjoy drinking, uh, as well as Frank Zappa. Um, and those guys, yeah, <laughs> Jed and Todd Edgar, if, uh, if they're out there, uh, I'm, I'm sure they're having a, a damned hoot, whatever they're doing. That's pretty hilarious that, uh, I mean, that it's awesome that they took an interest in you and that they, you know, you weren't just like some employee, like they were educating you on things too. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, you know, a lot of the folks who were working for them, like you could imagine, we're just college kids. They, would, you know, were happy to have a job, um, and they were really happy to have a job for a, a couple of, you know, laissez-faire, you know, highbrow ascot-wearing drunks. Yeah. Um, who, you know, their family was in politics, so they they were exposed to high culture and stuff like that. But they were very much the the punk rock version uh-huh. of that. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was cool. We we hit it off and. Um, I think they could tell that I didn't want to just get drunk and make a little extra money. I was looking to learn something and um, occupy my time. I had I was going to school on the GI Bill and what was called the Illinois Veterans Grant, so I didn't really need a job. But yeah. um, I enjoyed the work so much. I worked for them full time, um, and uh, yeah, they they turned me on to a, a lot of groovy stuff that I'm still enjoying today. And what were you going to school for there? Psychology. Psychology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you get to use that as like while you're, I don't know, I know you're not working in the tap room too often, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, one, one course that stands out, uh, that's particularly useful to me, uh, to this day was a, a course called sensation and perception. Um, and, 
yeah, just understanding that the world as you observe it and understand it uh, is not the way that the world necessarily is. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is so much there to experience. There's so much more there to experience if you just know how to look. Um, also, you know, giving me a lot of ways to, you know, describe flavor sensation and textural stuff. Um, uh, otherwise, it was, you know, kind of a liberal arts education. You know, it made me a, a much more complete human. Yeah. Um, you know, I still had a lot of growing up to do um, by that time. Uh, I mean, heck, I still have a lot of growing up to do now. Yeah. Um, but my psychology degree, you know, I, I did that because uh, when I was in the Air Force out of high school, I hated the job I was doing. And it was a super high tech job. And I just wanted to major in something that had absolutely nothing to do with lasers and terrain following radar and yeah. infrared uh, and all the other, you know, neat techie things I was working on. Um, couldn't really appreciate it when I was a 18 year old. Yeah, I know for sure. That's um, quite a bit to have to bite off. Like when you first out of high school, uh, and then, so from Eastern Illinois, how did you get set up with your first gig in with Rev and, and, uh, to make the transition to working in craft beer from the production side? Okay. Yeah. Uh, when I graduated from Eastern, uh, I, you know, I got a carryover job uh, as a Zamboni driver for a couple months at my local rink, which was, you know, I still smile thinking about that terrible job. Uh, <laughs> oh. But, uh, you know, it was the first time that, you know, uh, anyone ever asked me for my autograph. And it was little kids, you know, banging on the glass and stuff. And um, But then I, I wound up, you know, getting a job at a, a nonprofit up in Libertyville, um, about uh, an hour or so north of here. Um, and... Uh, you know, suffice it to say that uh, that job uh, kicked me out of the industry, uh, much like my experience in the Air Force kicked me out of technology. Um, you know, I just, uh, there was one person at that company that made my life a living hell. Mm-hmm. And because it was a nonprofit, I was also, you know, mowing my landlord's lawn every weekend uh, so that he would keep my rent lower. Um, and uh, after a, a short while, I came to the realization that, um, you know, I could be broke doing anything, but I didn't have to be unhappy. Yeah. Um, and uh, a friend of mine at the time said, why don't you know, just go to brewing school? And I said, what school? Uh, he said, well, you love homebrewing and you love beer. Uh, so why not learn how to brew commercially? And then, you know, maybe you can find a job brewing someplace. Uh, so... Uh, like a, another recent guest of yours, uh, Charlie Davis, uh, mm-hmm. he was actually in my Siebel course. We oh, took was this, Yeah, we took the concise course together in, I want to say, April of 2010. Uh, and upon completing our rigorous two-week uh, instruction there for the concise course, um, my friend or my friend's cousin um, from college uh, was Michelle Foyk. And uh, she was opening up with Jim Seaback, our brewmaster, Josh Deeth, uh, Krista, his wife, uh, executive chef then, uh, Jason Petrie, um, Greg Underhill, the list, list of royalty goes on. Um, they were opening Revolution, um, mostly out of Goose Island talent. Yeah. And uh, she said, hey, if, uh, if you want to come by the brewery one weekend and brew with Jim, Jim Seaback, um, you know, he said it'd be cool if you came by and observed a brew you know at that point it wasn't even volunteering it was less than volunteering it was you're in the room and you can ask questions but don't touch anything and uh you know try not to get on jim's nerves yeah Uh, and uh you know i really enjoyed that experience i still remember the the beer that uh, i watched jim brew that day uh coup de gras was an imperial version uh thereabout of our uh, then uh, year-round saison called Coup d'etat, which was part of the Repo Man soundtrack series, if there are any super fans out there listening. Um, and a number of months passed after that brew day, um, and I just thought, well, they're so busy, they, you know, they don't want me. But uh, I told Michelle, you know, anytime that uh, I could get that invitation back, I'd, I'd jump at it. Um, and we were at a Blackhawks game, um, would have been probably, uh, either early playoffs or 
like late season. And uh, Michelle said, oh, Jim said if you wanted to come by, you know, you can come by any time. Um, so more and more, it felt like uh, almost every weekend or every other weekend, I'd be driving down to Logan Square from Buffalo Grove, where I was living at the time. And, uh, you know, observation turned into volunteering, turned into assisting. Um, and then I was hired to wait tables uh, about a year and a quarter, year and a half into this endeavor. Uh, because the restaurant was expanding. They were opening up a second dining room upstairs as well as a second kitchen, a second bar. This is like a 2011, 2011 uh, above? Yeah, this would have been, I was I was officially hired in June of 2011. Mm. And uh, I was waiting tables uh, for three not very lucrative shifts a week. Uh, and that's how I was at least trying to pay uh, the bills. And then I had two brewing shifts a week. Um and uh, we did that, uh, or I did that, until um, the spring of 2012. Uh, at that point, uh, Jim and our then senior brewer, uh, he's our employee number one, he, he graces the Little Crazy logo, or uh, label, uh, Maddie Kemp. Mm -hmm. um, they left the brew pub to go commission uh, the brew house and the cellar um, at Kedzie. And uh, when the first batch was ready to keg, um, I went over there and I think I filled the very first kegs at Kedzie. Um, and we were all kind of chipping in. Uh, myself, the other assistant, Marco Reina, who's now a brewery owner down in uh, uh, just outside of Orlando. Um, we'd take turns going over to Kedzie to wash kegs because uh, we knew we were going to do a lot more keg filling uh, from then on. And, um, yeah, it, it was a uh, fast paced growth in the, in the first year that we were open at Kedzie, we were doing about an average of a thousand barrels a month. So we finished, you know, the, the eight months we were in operation there, uh, we did 8,000 barrels. The next year, our first full calendar year at Kedzie, we did 24,000 barrels. So it was 2000 barrels a month. The following year, uh, we were doing 4,000 barrels a month. Um, so the team was expanding pretty rapidly. Yeah. Uh, what was the what was the brew pub production like at that like prior to moving to Kedzie? Uh, I think we topped out just over twenty four hundred barrels uh, in two thousand eleven, maybe. So you guys grew exponentially. I'm sure you were still doing production at the brew pub. Yeah, it's starting to pick up at the brew pub. Uh, the The pandemic really put a lull on our retail operations. Um, you know, we we became much more reliant on packaged goods which we don't do out of the brew pub on Milwaukee. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's starting to come back. Um, but you know, it was, it was dreadfully slow there for a while. It was pretty bleak. Um, uh, but that was an experience shared by pretty much everybody with any kind of retail operation. Yeah. Um, unless maybe you were a plant store or something like that. Uh, Hobby Lobby was probably doing pretty good, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Um. <clears throat> yeah and then uh so you guys started expanding and the team started getting bigger uh and then um when did you start taking more of a lead role and um i know you started from listening to before you started uh, doing barrels in like 2013 ish yeah it would have been 2012 2013 um yeah, probably would have started doing barrel work in 2012 with jim uh, and had Rev been doing barrels like prior to that also, or is that something you guys started from the ground up then? Uh, we had done some limiting, uh, limited barrel work okay. out of the brew pub. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of space down there. Um, and, you know, we were two or three deep for, you know, a weekday evening most of the time. So we weren't really focused on the beers that took a long time to age, took a lot of space, um, took a lot of specialty you know, materials, it was crank out as much anti-hero and cross a gold and bottom up wit and Eugene Porter and coup d'etat as you, an iron fist as you possibly can. Um, Are you guys still in bombers at that time? We were not yet in bombers at that time. We started bombers, uh, when we went to Kedzie. So okay. like in 2011, when, uh, we did no packaging ever out of the pub. We did some, <clears throat> some limited keg work to support some bars and restaurants around Logan square. Um, and a little bit further outside of the neighborhood, but, uh, by and large, um, you know, we were 
we were brewing, you know, three, four days a week, pretty routinely. Um, you know, there weren't too many Saturdays that we weren't brewing at the mm-hmm. brew pub. Um, and, uh, you know, so we came to a, a point where we had to designate, you know, our brewers as either pub brewers or Kedzi brewers. And, uh, Marco who had seniority over me was asked, do you want to go to Kedzi or do you want to stay here, uh, and brew with our new pub brewer, um, then anyway, Will Turner, another Goose Island alum, uh, as well as a, a lot of other things. Um, and what a sweetheart of a man. Will, if you're listening, I love you, buddy. Um, well, Marco elected to stay at the brew pub with Will, which meant I didn't have a choice in the matter, and I was going over to Kedzie, and I was, I was pretty excited about that um, because you know I'm a, I'm a tall, gangly kind of goof, and I was hitting my head and shoulders and elbows and knuckles on every bit of exposed stainless that you could over the brew pub, um, hitting my head every day on low hanging rafters down in the in the cellar. Uh, I was elated to meet going over to Kedzi where I'd have a lot more space and some daylight. It was, it's a much more mentally healthy (laughs) environment, uh, to do difficult work. Um, so I was, you know, I'm Marco, I'm eternally grateful for you for (laughs) sticking it out at the brew pub and letting me go over to Kedzi. And then, um, I guess I, so did you have like did you kind of get pushed into barrels or was that something that you had an interest going into it? Um, as far as, you know, what made you jump to become focused on that over time? Um, at the time I was splitting, uh, our responsibilities of kind of like seller light and packaging lead. Um, so, you know, I, I'd, I'd get there early and fire up the canning line or the bottling line when we get the tank empty, everybody else would focus on cleaning that equipment and I would go over and I'd rinse the bright tank and set up transfers for tomorrow and, um, do that other kind of stuff. So I was kind of liaising between the seller and packaging. Um, and one evening Jim and I were filling barrels and, um, you know, he had been there probably 16 hours at this point. He was always the first one in to start the brews or start yeast pitching rather he'd call me out of bed and say, it's time, Marty, come on in. Uh, and I'd come on in and I'd, you know, finish up, uh, yeast pitches. Um, I'd start beer transfers, um, just doing that kind of seller stuff and then CIP in the tanks and everything. And then he'd start brewing and then he'd call Maddie in. Maddie would come in and finish up the brews in the brew house CIP. Uh, and then at that time on a good day, Jim would be able to go home. But if we had barrels to fill, um, you know, I would stick around with Jim and uh, just assist and observe and watch. Um, and uh, one night, you know, it had to have been probably late 2011. He asked me if I wanted to, you know, take responsibility for the barrel program. Um, and I had no ownership of anything else at the time. Uh, and I promised myself very early on in my career working for Jim that I would never tell him no. Um, unless I really needed to, like, I, I'm not a yes man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do like making him happy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, you know, it was a great opportunity, uh, for me to, you know, kind of cut my teeth and have my own little area of responsibility. Um, uh, and boy, how much has changed since then? Uh, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, that, 13 I mean, that, years ago. That brings us to the so the Rev Barrel program, referred to as the Deepwood series, which I think you may have referenced before. Uh, but I so I jotted down. You guys primarily do like oatmeal stouts, barley wines, rye wines, Scotch ales. I'm sure I'm missing something. Uh, yeah, I mean that the the heart of it is the oatmeal stout, D Star, and its iterations. The barley wine, straight jacket, and our rye wine, Rye Way to Heaven. Uh, the stout is about twice the, the volume of everything else. Uh, next in line is straight jacket, the barley wine, and then rye wine is uh, bringing up the rear. And then we'll we'll do limited, you know, specialty brews here and there. But uh, you know, yeah, they're, they're all big, dumb, and British. Yeah. The uh, is there was there a conscious choice to do the oatmeal stout? Like, is there something that the oatmeal stout brings out in a barrel aged beer versus just like a trip, typical imperial stout? Uh, Jim really likes oatmeal stouts. Um, 
he likes his high protein specialty grains and his high beta glucan specialty grains. Uh, it's a, a texture kind of thing. Uh, it gives uh, you know a nice silky mouth feel, is yeah. what what Jim would tell you. Um, so you get more body without having uh, what I refer to as the uh, the sugar penalty. You know, most of these beers that feel like that uh, feel like that because of their malt sugar um, concentration, which is you know they're starting to come back down to earth. But for a while there, they were pretty heady. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, so most of the time, when a beer feels like that, it's also going to be cloyingly sweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these high specialty grain um, or adjunct grains, uh, oats. Uh, wheat, rye especially. Uh, Jim loves throwing those into recipes because we can exaggerate the the texture and the mouthfeel uh, without hitting you over the head with malt sweetness. It's much appreciated. <laughs> um, so I, I just trying to hit some of the like the mainstays you mentioned, like the the D Star and all those. And then you guys have uh, some specialty runs with the VSO series and then the XO, which I just if you could just quick I mean, quickly talk about those, what those mean. Yeah, uh, starting with VSO, uh, very special old. Uh, it used to be just VO. I have um, what we call a barrel map, a very creative name. Um, and it's a bird's eye view of the barrel stacks. And on this barrel map, uh, I can see uh, beers, uh, base beers, and batch numbers. Um, and from there, I can reference, you know, I can look at their, the various uh, finishing gravities and ABVs and barrel types and stuff like that. But uh, um, when we first started uh, expanding the barrel program at Kedzie, we were buying bourbon barrels from a source that we didn't realize. Um, well, we, we realized that it was infecting, on average, about 20%, 30% of all the barrels we filled. Um and we just thought, well, this is just something we have to deal with. You know, if you're going to make barrel aged beer, you're going to have to be comfortable destroying a lot of beer. Um, and we, we didn't know how wrong that was until we got uh, a new barrel partner, uh, Midwest Barrel, now out of Louisville. Well, I'll be happy to talk more about them later. Um, but we got to a point where we were being able to produce more beer than we could sell. So we weren't emptying all the barrels that year anymore so we started getting some beers that were aging into their second year and to differentiate them uh, from their younger sisters on the barrel map i put vo for very old and just kind of a cheeky you know cognac reference uh, for myself it wasn't ever intended for you know public eye and uh, we then had a a batch of straight jacket i believe i know it was batch number 1228 um, and the mash had been compromised um, in such a way that caused the beer to grossly under attenuate. We were aiming for about 7 Play-Doh or 7% sugar finishing gravity, and this one finished upwards about 13. Um, and we couldn't just release that as straight jacket. It was almost twice as sweet as it was supposed to be. Um, so we brewed a corrective batch that we aimed to have it finish um, you know, inappropriately low. So this was our first foray into sweet component, dry component brewing. Mm -hmm. Um, So we blended, you know, half and half of those batches roughly uh, to make that year's straight jacket. And after the blending, we still had roughly half of both of those batches left over. Um, So we said, well, straight jackets already brewed and in barrels for next year. Uh, So we just decided to hang on to those barrels and re-blend it. And that would be the next year's straight jacket. When we opened up those barrels uh, to check them prior to blending, uh, we noticed the dry barrels were, uh, or the the dry component barrels, the low sugar component barrels, uh, were pretty stable. They were definitely oakier and they were a little bit more intense in flavor than they had been um, due to then what we just figured was the magic of barrel aging. And when we tested the sweet component barrels, uh, we realized something was, uh, there, there was a, a fundamental um, truth out there that we were just about to discover for ourselves. Other people, I'm sure, had already discovered it. Um, but the beer 
almost looked like a stout. It was super dark. It was noticeably darker uh, than it had been even the year prior. Um, and when we tasted it, uh, you know, I was still pretty focused on stouts. I really loved the stouts, and I just kind of tolerated the barley wines at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody was telling me, you know, Oh, this this uh, this barley wine is amazing. We we did a draft variant where it was, uh, I believe, a four barrel blend, and rather than doing fifty fifty, it was seventy five percent the sweet stuff and twenty five percent the drier. Um, and we put it on tap uh, at a release party, and uh, it was all anybody could talk about. And at that point, we had already, with the help of Josh Deeth, uh, changed VO to VSO. Uh, and instead of being very superior old, you know, like cognac, uh, we changed the S to special, um, just because it's, it's beer. It's not cognac. You know, yeah. we don't, we don't want to say anything is superior. Uh, uh, it just fits the, uh, it's the just, motto of Rev. Yeah. It's, it's just special. There are <laughs> special little barley wines. Um, and, uh, you know, before I knew it, you know, VSOJ had an identity, um, and it had this cult following. And if you weren't there to have it on draft that weekend, you know, or at a festival, uh, in the following few months, um, you didn't get to have it. Uh, but we put it into a package the very first year that we switched to cans in 2017. I want to say, I could be wrong. It's been a while. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the VSO is always going to be, um, volumetrically uh, about two years old on average mm -hmm. um, and we're starting to get away from that because we're realizing that it's not volumetrics um, it's not the ratios of the beer that's important it's the ratio and the ages of the sugars mm -hmm. um, and that's why the uh, the sweet components tend to have an outsized flavor uh, color and texture influence uh, over the um, the younger drier things um, so yeah VSO is going to be old it's going to be kind of like a caricature of the base beer so if we're going to do you know d star we've got a vso d yeah uh for straight jacket it's vso j uh ryeway we just released one uh vso r for you know very special old ryeway uh, and it's just to let the consumer know uh, that this is an order of magnitude above in maltiness in oakiness in uh flavor intensity um and it's it's just you know like i said it's kind of a caricature of the base beer um and they're usually pretty limited in quantity so they generally have a great rate of sale and uh yeah. a high uh, aftermarket trade value yeah uh i was gonna say yeah you see that pretty much all over and i know it gets like national following um, and then, yeah, you mentioned doing the, the one-off release parties, but in terms of like the other barrel age releases you have, you have the, the, the one-offs, which are sometimes single barrels, sometimes like a unique adjunct maybe added to it, or you have the sanctuary beers, mm -hmm. um, which that one, uh, you can, you can talk about it a little bit. We don't have to go too, too in depth. I know you've talked about it a lot. <laughs> oh no, I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, this being a music uh, podcast as well. I uh, should say Sanctuary. The Project Sanctuary is named after a song by this uh, psych rock, uh, formerly psych metal, drug metal band called Elder. Uh, used to be out of Boston. Now they're mostly, uh, three out of the four of them are living in Berlin. Um, but they're probably my favorite band that's still touring today. Um, and uh, they track one off of a record called Reflections of a Floating World uh, is Sanctuary. And it's just got this killer riff. Um, and, uh, so I needed a, a name for this program. And the reason why the name sanctuary was appropriate was, um, you know, back when we were sourcing barrels from that previous source, uh, we routinely had leaky barrels that were so leaky that we couldn't patch them. We couldn't bang on the hoops to tighten them enough, uh, to make them stop. But the beer inside was still perfectly good. Um, uh, but it just wasn't, you know, ready for release yet. So one day, um, you know, sick and tired of mopping up uh, all these uh, leaky barrels. Uh, I put about 30 of them uh, in, in a queue, basically. Uh, and I grouped them by stout and not stout. 
essentially. Um, you know, there were some porters and some stouts and stuff like that, but uh, rye wine, scotch ale, barley wine. Um, so I put them into those two categories, stout and not stout. And then, you know, I, I basically went down the line and I took leaky barrel number one and I racked it into a fresh bourbon barrel. But now leaky barrel number one was empty and fresh barrel number one isn't full. So fresh barrel number one gets topped off with leaky barrel number two. Yeah. And now fresh barrel number one is full, but leaky barrel number two isn't quite empty. So the rest of leaky barrel number two goes into fresh barrel number two. And now leaky barrel number two is empty, but fresh barrel number two is not yet full. So we get into leaky barrel number three on and on and on until we had established, I think, 25 unique blends, um, different proportions, different base beers. By then we were already doing sweet and dry uh, blend brewing uh, for much of the Deepwood program. Um, and then we just aged the snot out of them. Um, you know, some of these blends, if it was, you know, sweet component and sweet component or mid component and sweet component, they were ready, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, and those that tasted good early were released as, you know, sanctuary number one, uh, double barrel, VSOD or something like that, rye, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, those that were too dry, uh, and too hot to, to be released, uh, early, we just aged them until they were ready. So we aged them until we evaporated enough alcohol and enough water to concentrate the sugar so that we would then have enough to balance, uh, this now double bourbon barrel aged beer. Um, and everyone was different. They were all serially numbered. Um, and we'd put them on tap for our release parties as draft variants. Um, and they too, uh, quickly gained, um, the attention of some of the, um, uh, more discerning ruffians out there <laughs> who, uh, who came out to our releases. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, a shame, uh, because we've gotten so good at sourcing barrels now and our, our supplier is much better uh, than our previous supplier uh, or previous suppliers, I should say. Um, and we've gotten a lot better at fixing leaky barrels. So now uh, we almost have to engineer sanctuary barrels. We have to pretend they're leaking <laughs> when, when they're not. Um, but, uh, you know, to date, we, we haven't... Uh, we haven't forced into existence any sanctuaries. Yeah. Uh, everything is still true and organic, and it's you know a pair of leaky barrels uh, that we marry together and age till it's ready to go. Yeah, it's an awesome story and uh, uh, awesome beers that come out of it. Um, and then <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about you've mentioned about brewing the base beers and how you brew some beers that are super dry, some beers that are super sweet. Is that something that came by happenstance with the the vsoj that time and you just realized how how easy it was to blend to get like that that end product you wanted to get or is that something that um came prior to that vsoj blending that you were mentioning it was super sweet uh no it was it was that uh it was that ill sweet uh 1228 batch of barley wine that really got everything started for us in that respect and it took a while for us to learn that lesson you know, um, it was, uh, those sweet beers are highly time dynamic. Um, you know, so it takes a while for them to get where they're going to go. Uh, but they have a lot more potential, uh, for flavor intensity, at least with, uh, malt as your flavor vehicle. Um, and we realized, wow, we, you know, kind of, you know, walked backwards into this success. Um, let's replicate it and let's see how far we can take this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and within a couple of years we were brewing barley wines that were finishing at 15 to 18 Play-Doh, which, you know, we don't like to drink beers that are that sweet. Um, so we don't, we age them and we blend them. Um, and yeah, it, uh, you know, as, as we've gotten, uh, even more experience in this realm, um, we've learned how to pull, various levers with blending, um, so that we can economize or weaponize, you know, so, uh, economizing would be, you know, only 
putting as much um, dry component into the stacks at a time as you absolutely need, uh, understanding that it's a it's a pretty stable product. Uh, there's not much there to age. Um, where the sweet stuff is highly dynamic as a function of time. Um, so with a limited uh, square footage, your floor space and ceiling height, you know, we're, we're lucky we can stack six high. You know, we've got really high ceilings. Um, but we realized what was really important was the sugar. Uh, so we started getting as much sugar into the stacks as we possibly could or responsibly could uh, while having just enough dry component to blend that down. Uh, and we started seeing, um, you know, perceived age increase when the age in fact hadn't, or we could even decrease the average liquid age, the volumetric age you can reduce. Uh, and we saw the age of the average sugar molecule therein, uh, was increasing. Uh, so that's, you know, economization, you know, barrel stack optimization. Um, on the other side of that coin, you have weaponization and the exact same um, tendencies that I just described for economizing uh, can be turned on their head and we can get extremely um, flavor and aroma potent uh, beers, uh, especially paired with the proper barrel selection, aging conditions. Um, you know, we can, we can make caricatures of caricatures uh, without having to stress our liquid inventory very far. Um, so yeah, now, now it's, uh, blending is uh, indispensable to the Deepwood program. Uh, anytime we're doing a, a single batch of something where there's not a lot of opportunity to blend, I get a little bit nervous because these fermentations are, uh, pretty unruly, especially when you're at an IPA factory. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. Uh, most of the yeast we're using is coming off of Antihero or some other IPA, and it's stressed and it's pretty unhappy. Um, and uh, there's only so much of it to go around. Um, and then you put it in this, you know, super high sugar uh, fermentation. So it's sugar toxicity to start, and, you know, it finishes very high alcohol. So you have alcohol toxicity at the end. Um, that yeast is never happy. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, your former guest, Charlie Davis, you know, described the importance of happy yeast. And he's absolutely correct. Um, a happy yeast, happy brewer. Um, we have very unhappy yeast, so it, uh, you know, doesn't always do our bidding. So we've designed a system which allows for huge swings um, in uh, gravity uh, compared to our targets. So we can, we can miss gravities all day long. Um, and we won't bat an eye about it because at the end of the day, it's just a certain amount of sugar, a certain amount of alcohol and a certain amount of liquid going into the stacks. And that's our inventory. And we know that if we hit the mark in one direction or the other on, on this brew, well, the next one, we're going to get a chance to correct that. Yeah. So it's stress-free, um, and it builds in, um, naturally a lot more complexity than just executing the same batch over and over and over, and then aging that the same way and then blending it together uh, at the end of the year. Yeah, I love that. And <clears throat> all that talk about what's going into the barrels, I know that it's the the barrels that you've said is, you know, the anchor of the program and you want the barrel to be the star of it, despite all that thought of what's actually going into them. And um, that can bring us to the Midwest Barrel Company. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, just, yeah, I guess talk about them. Because I know I, even before we talked tonight, you've, talked glowingly about them so it's yeah i don't doubt that uh i've i've got a special place in my heart for ben and jess uh losk and uh um ethan schulenberg um i i'm gonna guess it was about 2015 2016 when they were opening um and i was pretty fed up with uh, one of the barrel suppliers that we were working with at the time and uh i got uh, an email from this guy ben who i'd never met before uh saying that he had you know some number of uh buffalo trace barrels available and asked if i wanted to buy them and um you know, I, I think I was having a pretty bad day, so I was I was kind of short and kind of cocky about it. And I just told him, uh, "Yeah, I'll, I'll 
I'll take 50 or, you know, whatever the number was. And that was a number that I don't think he was immediately prepared to deal with. Um, but, uh, you know, he said, yeah, no problem. And, uh, he went out and he sourced what barrels he didn't have. And, um, I got those barrels and they weren't leaking and they didn't infect our beer. <laughs> um, and the, the price was right. And it gave me an opportunity, uh, to say, you know, sayonara to, uh, as our former supplier who I was none too pleased with. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, as he's told me, uh, that was, that was like either his first or his first sizable order, um, that really gave him the financial inertia to launch, uh, or at least start growing Midwest barrel company mm -hmm. at the time they were located in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, in the last year or so they've, uh, procured space down in Louisville to be closer to yeah, their, uh, to their wares. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're getting better and more complex all the time as an organization and as a supplier. Um, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun, um, uh, you know, watching them grow, uh, and knowing that, you know, just a hot headed decision I made a long time ago was one of the things that, that helped them get there. They were going to get there without us anyway. Yeah. Um, helped you guys get, where yeah, you the, too. And, <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. Um, you know, the Deepwood program would not be where it is today without Midwest Barrel Company. And, uh, you know, Midwest would have, you know, I didn't teach them anything, you know, um, uh, they, they were going to get there on their own, but we were, a we were an important volume customer for them early on. Um, and to this day, they are the only barrel broker whose emails I will even open. Hmm. That's awesome. Uh, and then one of the things when we, we chatted before, that really stuck with me. Uh, you were referencing when you get a barrel and you're putting a, a beer in it, you're you're getting additive from the liquid that's left over in the barrel as well as the wood. And I mean, I know that it sounds kind of like obvious when you when you say it like that, but as somebody who's not uh, maybe as invested in the industry, I just thought that was like a cool concept of you're wanting to get the wet not the, the barrels that haven't been empty too long. You're wanting to get uh, them not only for the characteristics of the wood, but the liquid that had previously been in it as well. Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, um, you want, you want it wet. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to fill a barrel that's not going to contaminate our beer. Um, and a nice wet barrel is going to be soaked with ethanol. Um, it's a very clean environment. It's a beer clean environment. Um, it also would indicate that the barrel has been freshly dumped, so it's going to be tighter. It's going to be less likely to leak. And if you want to make beer and sell beer and drink beer and not feed it to the mop, um, that's that's important. Um, as to the age uh, of the barrels, you know, the older the barrel is, the less structurally sound they tend to be. Uh, it's not always the case, but it's, it's a tendency. And... Uh, the age of the spirit therein, you know, obviously the higher the age declaration, the sexier for the label and the menu. Um, but unless that's a very wet barrel, if it's a very old barrel, uh, you're not really getting much from it because it's told its story already. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, wood is, you know, Oak, uh, on the inside of a barrel is an extractable, uh, material, the same as your malt, the same as your hops, the same as the coffee grounds you use every morning. You know, it's water and not water and you put them together and you get water infused with whatever ingredient, right? Yeah. And at a certain point, your coffee grounds are spent. You can't get any more goodness from them. Um, <clears throat> the same as with your malt, with your hops. Um, you can't just keep pouring water over it and have the same product come off of it without refreshing uh, your materials. So at a at a certain point, a barrel becomes what we call neutralized. It's no longer capable of imparting any kind of meaningful wood flavor uh, to whatever you put in it. So the only way to recoup that wood flavor structure, uh, being like tannin, uh, is to recover the the whiskey or the wine or whatever it is uh, that previously resided in that barrel. And if there's insufficient liquid 
left in the wood fiber itself, then there's no way to recoup it. And really you're just oxidizing your product and you're evaporating it and you're telling a cool story. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you barrel age something and the beer comes out, you know, half, uh, ABV or one ABV above what you put it in, you really didn't get much out of it. Uh, so we, yeah, we, we like to see a nice two and a half ABV boost and that's, that's the dog's wet nose right there. That lets us know that the supply is good. Mm -hmm. uh, selection was good. Um, and then we'll work on, um, on blending, uh, appropriately, but, uh, like young barrels, you know, the longer you sit in it with your beer, the more of the Oak you're going to get into your product. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it's, we got to remember that what goes into a bourbon barrel, uh, first, uh, is it's white whiskey, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it doesn't really have a whole lot of appealing characteristics to it. It's the wood, um, extraction, uh, that is going to turn it from white lightning into something a little bit more respectful or respectable. Yeah. Um, and then if you're really aging a long time, the different, well, you know, if a barrel is going to, uh, neutralize after let's say 10 to 12 years, um, why is it that, you know, a 20 or a 24 year bourbon is so much more, uh, distinctive? Um, oh, that, you know, that's our friend evaporation coming in, you know, the alcohol and the water are evaporating, but the Oak extract is not. Mm -hmm. Uh, so everything you bring into solution through extraction will concentrate uh, it will reduce just like, uh, you know, a uh, bolognese on your stovetop. Yeah. Um, it reduces and therefore, um, your sugar goes up and your flavor intensity goes up. Um, and you're not just going to concentrate the flavors and aromatics, but you're going to be concentrating the color as well. Uh, that is why a 24 year bourbon looks so much darker than a 12 year bourbon. You're not really getting much more out of the barrel between years 13 and 20 whatever mm -hmm. um you know maybe some but uh it's not appreciable uh, yeah. most of that is due to our friend uh evaporative concentration that's awesome uh can you as someone who's who deals with uh barrel aging beers and you know tasting a lot of different things uh explain maybe somebody who's not uh who maybe hasn't had uh, i doubt anyone listening to this hasn't had a barrel aged beer but if anyone hasn't had a barrel aged beer it's sort of like what characteristics you're trying to draw out of that and maybe how you would describe the tannins that you get out of it is like a perception flavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you haven't had a barrel aged beer, um, you know, it's not the end of the world. There are plenty of them out there. Um, some better than others. Um, they're by and large, you know, if we're going to just, um, talk about, you know, big barrel aged, uh, British styles, right. Barley wine, stouts, rye wines, that kind of stuff. Um, these are going to be really intense. Uh, they are not meant to be, uh, they can be complex. They can be nuanced. You know, I, they, sh they should be. Um, but a lot of them, um, uh, get away with, uh, what we call blammo, which is just kind of one note. It's huge. It's in your face. Um, you know, it, the, one of the goals is huge flavor intensities, higher alcohol, uh, there are special occasion beers by and large, um, nothing wrong with having a barley wine on a Tuesday. Yeah. You. In fact, I, I recommend it, uh, wholeheartedly, but, uh, you know, most people are not crushing barley wines five days a week and then switching to Hellas on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're doing that, you know, come meet me. I'd love to pick your brain. Uh, so tannins, uh, you know, we, we refer to it as what gives like uh, structure in wine. Um, you know, it is on team hydrophobia. Um, so on the palate, let's say you've got a, uh, a sip of beer in your mouth. Uh, when you've got the entirety of that sip in your mouth or you have uh, enough volume that it's pooled, uh, that flavor is going to be locked onto your tongue and your tongue is going to be deciphering uh, all the magnificent, wondrous things, uh, happening in that beer. Um, and that's especially, uh, with malt as your flavor vehicle. So your malt derived, uh, your beer derived, uh, flavors and aromatics, they're going to be 
more or less bound to the liquid. Um, and that sugar uh, provides surface tension, so it has a tendency to hold that flavor on the palate. Once you swallow, you no longer have that reservoir of flavor uh, on your palate, um, and at which point the hydrophobia of the alcohol as well as the tannin, which is a polyphenol, um, not unlike what you might find in hops, um, has a tendency to almost like squeegee uh, the moisture, the remaining moisture off of your palate. Uh, And that's what gives you that kind of mouth smacking dryness, Mm -hmm. even though what you just had to sip, if it was a, you know, VSOJ, um, you know, that's 10% sugar. That's a sweet drink. Mm -hmm. Um, But if there's sufficient alcohol and sufficient uh, hydrophobic tannin uh, in solution, once you swallow, that's the end of the malt for you. And now you get oak and you get alcohol flavors. You start to get the fermentation uh, notes uh, as part of your finish. And that's that's one of our goals, like fine wine, is to have a uh, well-defined start, middle, and end. And it has to do with controlling the chain length of the sugars uh, of the malt to give you, you know, you want some, some, some simple sugar up front to give you a, a, a little bit of sweetness right off the bat. Um, And then we like to backload um, the sweetness on the mid palate by using uh, or preserving long chain sugars that take your palate just a little bit longer to recognize. Um, And that's your mid, uh, so we call that mid palate sweetness. That's where we like most of our sugar to reside. Um, And that's your middle. And then the finish should be just a celebration of alcohol and wood. Um, So we have a, ideally a a well-defined beginning, middle, and end, not unlike a fine wine. Yeah, I love that. I mean, uh, you, you've reused the word complexity often, but that that journey that you that uh, uh, some beers can take you on, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I never knew why, but now I do. <laughs> so it's, There you go. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, do you, uh, n- next I kind of just want to go into like what a day in your life at the brewery looks like and maybe the team that's, that's with you on the barrel program. Oh, I'd love to. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate not to have a very typical day. Uh, you know, every, every day this week has been different. Every day before that was was different. Uh, a lot of that has to do with you know I'm getting uh, not pulled away from production, um, but it's no longer my singular focus. Uh, I'm doing a lot more writing. I'm doing a lot more um, educating with accounts who are coming to to do barrel events. Um, like we, we just stopped doing barrel picks recently uh, because everyone was picking the same barrels. You know, you're gonna sample uh, ten barrels, uh, and they're gonna all choose VSOJ, and the other nine barrels you just opened up, and sampled, and oxidized to not get picked. Mm-hmm. And everyone's gonna pick from the same batch of VSOJ anyway, right? Uh, so I mean, I'm not gonna say that wasn't fun, but uh, we started doing uh, a new program, a new approach where we're doing a like a boozy classroom session, and um, then we're allowing these retail agents or groups of retail agents to design a barrel aged beer. So we'll let you design a, a barrel. So we, we call this. Uh, we haven't we haven't gone public with it uh, at the time of this recording, but I'm sure we'll uh, we'll have something soon. Uh, it's called build a barrel. Oh, uh, just like, uh, that, uh, that store in the mall that, yeah. uh, I'm not going to name. Um, so I'm doing a lot more of that sort of thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing more on the keyboard and more talking than I am producing. Um, that distinction, uh, belongs to, uh, my longtime barrel partner and revolution OG, uh, Victor Maravilla. It was absolutely indispensable. Um, just like Midwest Barrel Company, the Deepwood program would not be anywhere close to what it is today without um, his dedication and hard work over the years. Um, he's gotten so good at his job that I don't have to tell him what's up uh, most of the time. He just knows what to do, and it's done before I even get to the brewery. That's and nice. that allows me to focus on um, designing the beers and you know, keeping my stress level low so that I can, you know, be joyful about this. It's much easier to come up with clever, quirky names and ideas um, when, you, when you're when you not miserable. Yeah. 
uh, and uh, Victor is uh, among the the top five best things that I have in my life in my career. Uh, so Vic, if you're listening, I love you, buddy. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw like you said had the the build a barrel program hasn't gone live yet, but I saw some entities from the Northwest uh, post meeting with you recently. So, oh, from uh, Rockford, Rockford, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I follow one of the guys out there and I saw him post it. Uh, so uh, how many, and you don't have to know the automatic number, but the, how many barrels do you think you guys have right now? Uh, somewhere in the tune of about 1,300, 1,300 and change. And how often are you having to taste those? Is it just like maybe like a quarterly thing? Or? Less than that even. Less. We're not even tasting everything all the time. We taste everything uh, that's got at least three months in barrel uh, about once a year. And that's not everything. That's like a couple barrels from every lot. So every batch of beer and every type of barrel that that batch went into is its own lot. So we'll find in the stacks and sample in place. Uh, we'll, you know, run it to the lab so we get the numbers on it. The, uh, pardon me, the alcohol and sugar content um, for downstream blending purposes. And then I'm also jotting down kind of the, the top note uh, sensory data for it you know is it front palate sweetness is it mid palate sweetness uh is it uh coconutty or is it you know a lot of vanilla or is it cherry um just anything that's going to help me down the line uh is is there a little bit of like musty umami you know that okay well if you find something like that you don't want to put too much of that mm. into any one beer yeah. you know that's going to be a, a a characteristic that we would prefer to blend away uh as much as possible uh so we're just grabbing like you know that that top note uh, sensory uh, and and those numbers from the lab, um, and then we you know start designing the blends based on the volumes that we are told um, from sales. Basically, uh, you know how much how much beer do we need to package, and then we start shopping the inventory for the right number of the right barrels to get the right relationship of sugar and alcohol and age and oakiness and complexity into whatever that beer is. And the, the sensory panels that you, t- you just mentioned, that's, that's a, like a, not a large amount of people, but it's not just you and Victor, right? Like it's like, I mean, there's, there's multiple people doing this. Uh, when Jim is available, he'll come down and, and sample a few barrels with us. Uh, when Victor and I happen upon uh, a lot or a barrel uh, that just totally surprise us or blow us away, uh, and in rare circumstances, maybe even concern us a little bit. Uh, I'll shoot Jim a text, and you know if he's available, he'll come down. Uh, mm. you know, it used to be just Jim and I tasting every single barrel before blending, mm-hmm. um, and now we're a little bit more proactive because there's so much more complexity in the beer lineup as far as sweetness and age, and um, you know if we are going to use a fruity or a sugary adjunct, you know we have to make sure we're leaving space for it uh, in the malt profile you don't want to add a sweet adjunct to an already sweet beer yeah. uh, and then you're making a pastry beer uh, yeah. and i don't want to say that you don't want to do that it's not a hard and fast rule it's uh it's a preference at revolution that we don't uh we don't like to make beers that are overly sweet you know you can have sweetness um but uh only because you need that sweetness to be uh, a balancing agent for oak and alcohol primarily yeah so how would i know like the the quick answer for like the the brewery's perspective of this would just be sales but how do you personally define success of the program like where, where do you where do you look to you know there's there's a number of places you know you i don't think you could look to just one um you know the the unfortunate thing about uh, this little hobby of mine is that it is a business um, and we need to make sure we're getting a return on the time and materials invested. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, if we can't build the, the business around the barrel program, that's not a failure. Um, you know, we want to, we want our employees to be excited about the beers. I want to be excited about the beers. Uh, I want to see the sparkle in the eye of my coworkers when they, smell and taste one of these monstrosities for the first time. Um, 
I want it to look really good for the brewery. I want to add to our reputation. Uh, I want the whole world to know about revolution. And if that's because of anti-hero or if that's because of the deep wood program, I really don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just love this brewery. And, uh, you know, if, if the way that I have to enact changes or, you know, improve or bring value, um, if it's through barrel work, then that's what I'll do. Um, yeah, we, I want to surprise people. Um, you know, I want the, uh, I want the adults in the room to be impressed. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to educate people. Um, and I, you know, I want people to respect revolution. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if we can make some money and, you know, get dental insurance for our employees, then, you know, that's, that's a really good thing too. Yeah. I've had, uh, I think you guys have, yeah, I'm sure you know, you still, yeah, you still have the hype, um, arguably the best barrel program in the city. Um, I would say so, but, uh, like I still have, I had a friend today text me about the super massive cafe, cafe Deeth announcement mm-hmm. that went out to the, the email list. And, um, yeah, I, mean, I think there's still some excitement out there. Like every time you guys are coming out with something, even the old standards, everyone's, you know, got to get their four pack of the straight jacket and the, the D star and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a goal, uh, to always be improving. Um, you know, even if the label doesn't change one year to the next, if the name doesn't change, um, you know, these are vintage products. The liquid is always going to change. It's pointless just to try and make the th- same thing over and over and over again. It's also dull. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I'm fond of saying that uh, consistency is the enemy of improvement. You know, we are trying to um, wow people every single year. And if you've loved Straight Jacket for 10 years, I want you to know in the, in the, in the bottom of your heart, um, you know, every October, that next month you are going to have the best Straight Jacket you've ever had. Um, we want all these beers to just improve and improve and improve. All right. So you've been talking about how, uh, your mission is to make Rev look good and you're, you're always continually working on improvements and, uh, just curious, I don't, like on a practical sense, what does that look like? Oh boy. Um, I can say I, I've, I've heard you, you, you talk about like the move into the balance value metric and you, I've been talking a lot about the numbers and the, the sweetness oh, yeah. and everything like now. Uh, oh, yeah. So that's sort of, yeah. So like one example would be, yeah. What we call balance value This a uh, number of years ago. Um, we took two vintages of the three mainstay deep wood beers. Uh, it was like the freshest and the year before. And um, myself as well as some of the other brewery leads went into the, um, QC sensory tasting lab and uh, you know we poured you know both years of stout both years of barley wine both years of rye wine and I laid out um, you know I had this idea going into it that you know uh, inspired the meeting in the first place this tasting um, that uh, you know what really defined the way balance worked for the barrel aged beer you know wasn't uh, sweetness and IBUs like it was in British pale beers, IPAs, pale ales and stuff like that. You know, everything has an appropriate level of bitterness, right? Uh, for a particular style, but you know, hot bitterness doesn't really mean a whole heck of a lot uh, to barrel aged English barley wine. You know, it's, it's inappropriate to make it too bitter anyway uh, then you have an American barley wine. <laughs> but as a result of the aging, the IBUs, the hot bitterness falls off and you know, it's got a half-life um, so as I described before you know uh, team hydrophobia your uh, your tannin from oak as well as your alcohol are the primary drivers in making your barley wines and English stouts uh, balanced uh, at least in the barrel aged varieties um, so I figured hey uh, let's just do a, a quick you know, rough calculation here. Uh, and I designed this metric called balance value, which is quite literally finishing gravity post barrel expressed in degrees Plato or percent sugar, which is a very common brewery metric. Um, 
and alcohol. Uh, so we weren't really quali- quantifying oak tannin. We're still not quantifying it. But uh, again, this is a metric that gets us in the ballpark, as we say. Um, and uh, we said, okay, if you divide uh, finishing gravity in Plato by alcohol, and you just take the two-digit decimal, uh, the higher that number, the sweeter the beer is going to present. The lower the number, the drier it's going to present, and the more the oak is going to tend to shine um, at any oak concentration. Um, and we tasted, you know, last year's, and we tasted this year's, and we said, okay, this is the balance value for last year. This is the balanced value for this year. Where do you think this beer drinks the best? You know, now we're going to try to put a number to it, you know, so not a little bit sweeter, not a little bit drier, but how much, what's the actual number? If this is 0.4 and this is 0.5, meaning 0.4 units of sugar for every unit of alcohol or 0.5 units of sugar for every unit of alcohol, um, which do you like more? And would you like to see it even drier or even sweeter? And uh, we just went around and came to a consensus more or less of the optimum expression of that recipe uh, as, a, as a function of balance. Um, and then we, you know, that was a, kind of the first step in optimizing the barrel stacks and getting more efficient uh, or being able to weaponize uh, more effectively um, because we had numbers that we could work off of. Uh, after that, um, so yeah, the, the first goal was, uh, you know, let's stop infecting the beer, you know, so quality, <laughs> yeah. quality was the first step. I remember this now, uh, memories being jogged. Um, so yeah, I was, a, it was meant to be a three step approach to, uh, improvement. Uh, the first was let's stop losing all this valuable beer. Uh, and once we had that problem sorted, uh, we weren't losing any more barrels. We haven't lost a barrel to infection and uh, a, a whiskey barrel. We haven't lost like a big strong beer in a whiskey barrel to infection in probably seven or eight years now. Um, you know, there's probably seven or 8,000 barrels we filled consecutively uh, successfully. And part of that was <clears throat> moving from barrel aging the gene series. Uh, yeah, there was, there was that. You know, back then we were also using barrels that were directly contaminating the liquid so they were diff- they were from the prior yeah diff- so that the you know step one stop losing beer in itself was a multi-step approach it was okay no more beer under 10 abv gets to go into a barrel um and uh you know there were a couple other things we we did we tightened up our our purging um uh, regimens um and just got super super clean about everything or as clean as you can in a barrel program it's it's dirty yeah <laughs> it's very dirty um but the the beer is clean um so yeah step one stop losing all of jim's beer <laughs> uh step two was consistency uh and i know you know consistency is the enemy of improvement but uh you know we had so much to improve upon um you know, consistency, you could, you could call it predictability. Um, you know, it's like a, it's a control, um, that you could use for consistency. Um, at least in this point we have a consistent amount of sugar and alcohol, you know, so that's going to stay consistent. That was step two was consistency. So the balance value metric was, uh, created to address that goal Mm -hmm. of, uh, having more consistency and repeatability. Um, once we had that sorted, uh, the third was complexity. We wanted to start designing complexity in. Um, so we developed another metric. Uh, and this one's a mouthful of MCVM or malt complexity value expressed in months. And that was simply uh, that barrels or that lots um, finishing gravity times the months that it spent in barrels. Um, and we talked about, you know, how time dynamic the sweeter components are uh, because there is more to oxidize Uh, so then if you have more to oxidize and you spend more time oxidizing and evaporatively concentrating it um, you're going to notice that uh, having a sweeter beer aged for a longer period of time is going to get you 
uh, near comical levels of uh, flavor, aroma, and texture, and color intensity. Um, and so we, we just started uh, designing the process and the blends to uh, maximize this MCVM uh, figure. And I, I think to make it more digestible in the future, I, I might rebrand that uh, as uh, MOV or malt oxidative value. Um, and, you know, it, it's important to, to note here that higher numbers are not necessarily better numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, they are indicative of something. It's there to communicate something um, quickly uh, to, the, to the people who are responsible for blending something into existence. Um, so, you know, it, if, for instance, like uh, straight jacket, if it's <clears throat> blended to be seven Play-Doh, and it's an average of 12 months in barrels, that's an MCVM or an MOV of 82, right? Uh, now, do a VSO version of it and, you know, make it uh, 12 Play-Doh, and now age it for 24 months, um, and now you've got, what, 288. So you're just doubling the time in barrel, uh, but you're more than tripling you're almost quadrupling you know i think you might actually be quadrupling um at that point uh the mov or mcvm mm -hmm. in that case and again a higher number is not a better number um it is just there to communicate a tendency uh more malt more time uh more concentration due to evaporation uh and you have much higher intensities your flavors are going to change a lot uh so right now uh you know we that three pronged approach you know we've, we've kind of I don't want to say mastered that but you know we can put it to bed you know we'll still use it mm -hmm. um, but we know its value and we know its limitations uh, next we're going to be you know we're really focusing on um, playing around with what I call the holy trinity which is extraction you know touching the wood touching the whiskey and bringing it in, into solution oxidation you know, as a function of time and, and sugar um, and the uh, concentration through evaporation. Uh, now we have these methods to play with those three factors so that we can really turn up uh, extractive flavors uh, without necessarily over oxidizing the beer or over concentrating that overly oxidized beer because it can get away from you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, we were we were surprised. Uh, you know, as, as soon as we tried to go for the headiest MCVM we possibly could, we realized that the the beer sucked for it. Um, which is why I, I have to stress: a higher number is not a better number. Um, but you want some of that lower number stuff on there, uh, or in that blend, um, because that is your liquid bread component, right? That's your your biscuit, your cracker, and stuff like that. Your older, sweeter stuff is more your jam. Um, and you know everyone that i talk to about this you know they don't just want jam and they don't just want the biscuit they want jam on a biscuit mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, even in vsos uh, we no longer shy away from putting you know five to eight month old beer in that blend um, because we want to have a, a wide cross section of malt characteristics we don't just want fruity jammy bomb and we don't just want something that uh, doesn't taste aged at all. Um, so we want that complexity. Um, is that is that typically uh, like you were referring to earlier with like the front palate, mid palate? That plays into it. It's it's closely related, um, but that has more to do with the chain length of the sugars. So okay. if they're very simple sugars, uh, like glucose, um, like maple syrup, that is sweet as soon as it hits your lips. You yeah. know. Um, you know, obviously your lips can't taste sweetness. It's still your tongue doing it, but, um, you know, it's, it's evident right away that there is sweetness there. Um, the, uh, the oxidative stuff is really just about the quality of the sensory of the sugar. Is it bready? Is it fruity? Gotcha. Um, and the chain length is all about four palate versus mid palate. So where on the palate is, is the sweetness concentrated? Yeah. I love how much of a, <clears throat> a science it, it really can be. And um, that kind of goes into, well, I, I wanted to mention, again, you were talking about consistency, and I heard you mention before that the alcohol level on a beer can be different year to year, but it's really like the drinking experience 
that you guys are trying to be consistent with. So it isn't the same exact beer. You're just trying to like replicate an experience, I guess, if that makes yes. sense. Yes, absolutely. Uh, case in point, the balance value target for uh, any VSO beer is the same as the double barrel iteration of that same VSO beer. Um, so double barrel VSOJ, for instance, is not just VSOJ double barreled. It's a blend um, that was put together from a, a mix of first barrels blended into a tank to homogenize it and turn it into just one controllable component and then rebarrel that. But it's blended to go back into barrels. So mm-hmm. we're, we're going to assume another two and a half ABV uptick uh, from that second barreling. And with that two and a half ABV uptick, uh, we are going to turn up the malt sweetness in the blend uh, by that same uh, ratio to keep that relationship identical. So whether your VSOJ is, you know, regular old single barrel VSOJ or the double barrel version, um, the intensities are going to be turned up, but the balance should be the same. Um, so yeah, the drinking experience you know, it should be approachable. It should be pleasing. Um, and, uh, you should be able to know what you're going to get. You know, maybe one year's got more vanilla and the next has more cherry. You know, we can't control what we extract from the wood that mm-hmm. tightly. You know, we're happy to get any of those wood based flavors. These are vintage products. Um, our job is to give you a quality product. Uh, and if some of those nuances change, they're going to change. Yeah. Know? I mean, there's some artistry in that though. I think too, like, you don't, like you said before, you don't want it to be exactly the same. No, absolutely. I, yeah. I don't want you to say, Oh, straight jacket. I've had it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I want no. you to go, Oh, I had it. And I, I'm confident that next year's is going to be even better, you know, bigger, yeah. uh, ratter, whatever it is, but it's still going to drink like straight jacket. Always pushing the, uh, pushing things forward. Uh, so did I, I just out of curiosity as, as far as like Im- improving the product was that the motivation for moving from cans to the or from bottles to the cans or is that something that uh, just because you guys got a canning line it made it easier uh, more the latter yeah um, you know we we upgraded from a uh, RC cola filler that we had to modernize with a lot of time and money uh, over the years. And, uh, when we finally got the, the new fourth generation KHS 40 head filler, um, you know, the decision, you know, from Josh D the owner, chairman of the party, uh, you know, the, the simple way to say it is we are a canning brewery. Mm. Um, so we put our money where our mouth is and, uh, we're a canning brewery. So the deep wood goes to cans and, uh, it's a much with a million dollar canning line is you know, going to have by and large better initial quality than the same beer put through a $20,000 bottling machine. Um, you know, technology has gotten better in the intervening years, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're a canning brewery and that's the, uh, that's the short answer. And, uh, initial quality is, is very good. Um, but, uh, with these alcohol levels, especially when people are, buying more than what they can keep refrigerator cold for as long as they're going to keep it. Um, over time, you know, you will experience some degradation of the now California compliant non BPA, uh, can linings or can liners. Um, and they will start to leach into the product after enough time. What, what's enough time? Well, it depends on the alcohol and it depends on the temperature that you're keeping the beer. Yeah. Um, colder is better. Um, but even a refrigerator cold beer in a can is going to be a different story three, four years down the line uh, mm-hmm. than it is now. So that's another thing I like to push constant improvement uh, in the initial quality um, because I want to compel you as the customer to come to the brewery, go to the liquor store, whatever, buy the beer, keep it cold, enjoy it, uh, and come back next year. because you are not going to age any of these beers into a state of improvement. I guarantee you that. Yeah. Uh, That's something I need to take to heart too. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to, we're going to do everything we can to make a better, more compelling product next year. Uh, So buy it now, enjoy it now. uh, And then 
come see us again next year. And we're releasing these beers every quarter now. Yeah. You know, yes. it's, it's like every other April, um, you know, but so this year it'll be January. We just announced April super massive plus two brand new 19 twos, uh, and variants for that. Uh, we'll have uh, a summer release and then we'll have our customary three fall and winter releases. We're releasing these beers literally every quarter. Yeah. Uh, there is no need to buy six cases of straight jacket and have it for five, six years yeah. uh, and keep revisiting it. Uh, you know, I don't want to discourage you from spending money at, at our releases, you know, yeah. uh, you know, we want you to buy the beers, um, but don't buy so much that it becomes a burden to you. Uh, mm -hmm. and that the beer is kind of dying on the vine before you have an opportunity to enjoy it. Um, I would expect that would only make people less likely to want to come back, uh, to the brewery and, and buy more the next year. So, yeah. Uh, and we make enough of those base beers that, uh, they're not going to sell out too quick. If you really like it and you plow through your four pack quicker than you thought you might've come on back, we probably still have it. And if we don't, we've got something else that just dropped. Yeah. Yeah. The guys are always, uh, keeping it fresh with that. Um, are there any barrel treatments that you maybe haven't worked with that you're, that you, you, you want to, um, yes. Uh, a lot of these are unicorns. They're things that I wished I could find more easily. Uh, and a couple of them I've been able to tick off the box or the, the, uh, the checklist, um, in the last year. Um, I love rum barrels. Uh, but I also hate rum barrels. Typically rum barrels are Jack or Jim barrels that go down to the Caribbean or wherever and they'll get used up several times mm -hmm. and then they'll sit in customs on the way back to us. And again, that barrel has more than told its story. And drying out while it's sitting. Yeah. yeah, it's a tired barrel with nothing more to give. Uh, you know, and when you're reusing these barrels over and over and over, you're not only neutralizing the wood, but the spirit left in the wood that you can then extract as a brewer uh, becomes less and less compelling itself. Um, so they're, they're rickety, they leak, uh, and they often don't really give you that much. Uh, this year I had an opportunity to buy some um, Cruzon rum barrels, which have only seen rum for, I believe, a year. Um, so a super young brilliant beautiful or maybe that was the uh the añejo tequila we just got um but we, we just got some tequila barrels that we filled in the last uh, year and some cruise on rum barrels i have to check my notes on the exact details of all of them but young wood in these non-whiskey um spirits i want more of that please um you know i love bourbon i'm not getting sick of bourbon um but i do want to play around with more stuff and the further you get from four-year bourbon the more you're rolling the dice on buying that cask because those rum casks are not coming in at the same price of the bourbon cask they're usually going to be more uh -huh. you're paying import prices and um you know you tells a great story on the label uh, but unfortunately that's usually as far as it goes uh -huh. um also just filled some uh, liqueur cerise barrels from France uh, and I only got two uh, I was offered a lot more but I was gun gun shy about them yeah um, you know you know they seemingly took forever uh, to get to Chicago from France um, but uh, that's just know, a cherry liqueur yeah okay uh, in French oak barrels <clears throat> and uh, <sighs> They came stateside and they were sitting at uh, Midwest Barrel Company and uh, they're like, hey, we've got your two barrels um, when you want us to ship them. I'm like, well, don't ship us two barrels. Like, wait till we've got a, a truckload and put those on the truck. You know, otherwise we're going to pay dollars uh, a yeah. piece for the barrels um, and we're going to, you know, probably come close to doubling their cost um, just by shipping them on their lonesome. Uh, so a lot of it was our delay. You know, we, we waited until we had an order of a, of a truckload and we said, what, bring them in. And I looked at the barrels and they, they looked a little beat up. It looked like some of the wood had been swapped out and just like outwardly looking and counting the months since we ordered them. Um, I was 
I was pretty sure that uh, it was just going to be uh, an expensive experiment that didn't really pan out. We, you know, the folks in Midwest said, no, the, the barrels still have liquid in them. Um, and we opened them up and had a lot of liquid. And then I was nervous again, because normally if there's a lot of liquid in a barrel, uh, that means that, uh, you know, somebody rinsed it, mm. you know, or they try to hydrate a head, um, you know, to tighten up the barrel. But, you know, before it was fully hydrated, all that water's dripping into the barrel and diluting all the spirit. And then you're yeah. going to go infect your beer because it's no longer beer clean. Um, Victor and I tilted the barrel and got a sterile sample of it. We pulled it out and it's foolproof, beautiful, crystal clear, reddish pink cherry liqueur with complexity for days. Um, do you guys have a lab on site then? You can we do have a lab on site, <clears throat> uh, but this was just sensory. Oh. We just, we just stuck a sterile pipette in there with a little, uh, squeezy bottle yeah. like on an old uh, manual blood pressure cuff. Um, and we just sucked up a, a little sample, dropped it into little plastic cups on the production floor, smelled it, swirled it around. It precipitated legs on the, uh, on the plastic and, you know, it just tasted wonderfully. And there was so much of it in the barrels. We were giddy uh, cause we knew we were about, we knew what we were about to put in the barrels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that'll be a, a draft variant to look forward to in January of uh, 25 or maybe November 24. Uh, but it'll be a double barrel VSO something oh, okay. uh, finished in liquor cerise or liquor cerise. Um, and we're already looking at getting more uh, and uh, got, a, got a good idea of a project to execute with uh, a whole bunch more of those barrels. <laughs> It's exciting news to, to think about. Uh, so last question before we move on to the next section, but do you, you kind of hinted at this earlier, but do you ever get sick of tasting barrel aged beers? I have in the past, uh, but it's, it's not anything that lasts. Um, you know, a horror story that Jim and I are fond of commiserating about um, is uh, when he and I used to be the only ones tasting the barrels prior to blending. Uh, and we taste every single barrel prior to blending. Uh, and the, Deeth Star and Cafe Deeth is uh, part of the same batch. So we just empty all the barrels for both into one big blend. We split off a portion of that to package as Deeth Star and the rest goes to Cafe. Um, so we have to taste all those barrels. And, uh, you know, it's an October release, which means we're racking the barrels empty in September. And one year, late September, Jim and I have got about better part of 300 oak barrels spread all around the brewery, like everywhere um, we could fit it, that forklifts could still drive around. Uh, there were barrels there stacked too high. And uh, in the brewery space, I think it was, you know, it was high 90s with extreme humidity. It was just miserable. And um, scheduling constraints meant that one day we had to cram in like 202 barrel samples in mm. basically a hundred degree humid brewery in one day. Um, and you know, you, you might point out, well, what kind of sensory assessment can you really do, you know, doing that many barrels in an environment like that? And you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> really what we're doing in that last final check, uh, is grabbing a pH to make sure that there's no lactic acid bacteria, um, that is, uh, uh, increasing acidity. Uh, so we check the pH meter and make sure that every barrel is consistent with its sisters from the same lot. And then we're doing a real quick sensory check just to check for any kind of brett, any kind of funkification or, yeah. um, anything else that might be dangerous to blend in to the rest of the good beers and the good barrels. Um, at that point, we're also picking out a few top notes, you know, if we notice like, oh, wow, we're getting a lot of cherry from these Templeton rye barrels. Well, we'll store that little nugget, you know, and we'll know the next time we're going to do a cherry beer to try to get Templeton if we can. You know, that's just one example. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I tell you what, uh, <clears throat> Jim and I were both well sick and tired of sampling barrels uh, by the end of that day. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, but otherwise, it, it's much more pleasant than that. Um, and we've, we've improved things so much that... Um, most of the time, all the barrels are tasting good, even the dry components. Uh, it's a lot more pleasant now than it was, say, in 2011, 2012. Nice. Or 2012 
two thousand through like two thousand fourteen. I wanted to jump into some of your your travels that you you do, and um, I guess you'd call it an internship, but with Hermit Story Wines. Yes, uh, so I took a uh, sabbatical uh, in two thousand twenty-two. Uh, Revolution uh, and Josh, namely, kind enough to give all of his. Um, employees with 10 years of full-time service, um, eight, up to eight weeks off, um, for a sabbatical. And, uh, when I got my opportunity, uh, to go, uh, I knew I wanted to take a solo road trip out West. Um, I'm a national park rat. Um, so I, I spent the first half of my sabbatical driving in my VW golf, um, and it hit in about 10 national parks in the U S and Canada and just camping and hiking and drinking beers, uh, and whiskey fireside, uh, by my lonesome. Um, and that was, uh, that was a great reset for me. That was, um, it's like taking off an old crusty bandaid, you know, and kind of exposing my soul and my spirit to the fresh air again. Um, and, uh, I capped that experience with, uh, a 28 day stay in, uh, at Herman story wines in Paso Robles, California. I had a, uh, a friend who used to work at uh, Firestone Walker, uh, Kenny Ichimaru, who is a big wine guy as well. Um, and, uh, uh, my partner at the time had told me, Oh yeah, you know, we were in, in Paso for the Firestone invitational one year and we we're driving down, uh, Paso Robles street uh, in downtown Paso. And, uh, she had pointed to, you know, some window above a tire shop or something like that and said, Oh, that's Herman story wines. That's where, uh, that's where Kenny, uh, Kenny Ichimaru, uh, you know, he, he helps out, you know, for harvest. Like he works at that winery, you know, during harvest season when it's really busy and he stays and lives at the winery upstairs. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of a passing comment. You know, I was thinking about the beers I was about to be pouring and presenting at you know, North America's greatest beer festival, Firestone Walker Invitational. Um, and uh, well, maybe other than Fobab. I was giving up for Fobab. Uh, what up, Fobab? Uh, and uh, yeah, years later, I thought, well, you know, my sabbatical, uh, I was sitting in a campsite in Big Sur at Pfeiffer Burn State Park around a campfire with Josh Deeth um, in, say, 2019. We were in town for the Invitational, and uh, uh, he was a late addition to the group that was going out, and I had already reserved a, a, a campsite in Big Sur. Uh, so he, he he's a huge uh, outdoors guy, too. Um, absolutely loves nature. And uh, so he came camping with me. We're sitting around uh, eating steaks around a fire and uh, listening to Neil Young and doing all the things that boys do at campsites. Uh, and... <laughs> He goes, you know, I'm thinking about instituting a sabbatical policy or, or thereabout, you know, not a direct quote. Um, and I said, well, I know what I would like to do, but I don't think anyone had ever let me do it. And that's come out and work uh, harvest out here in Paso uh, one year. And, well, why couldn't you do that? Well, because it happens at the same time as Deepwood season. Mm. And he told me something that uh, you know, I'll never forget him saying, well, you know, if with enough planning, if we can't get that figured out for you, then, you know, we've got bigger problems, something to the effect of that. And you could have knocked me over with a feather. Um, I, I got home and I, I asked Jim like, Hey, Josh said this was cool. How do you feel about it? Cause Josh can say yes. And you can say no. And if you say no, it's a no. Yeah. Right? Um, and Jim loves Paso, um, uh, being a former Firestone, uh, uh brewer himself, um, uh, and a huge wine guy, uh, you know, he's like, no, I, I think that's a great idea. You know, let's let's talk about it and let's find a, a way to make it work. And Jim's a very old school guy. You know, is no nonsense at all. Um, and I was shocked when he told me, yeah, let's let's try to make it happen. And then I finally had to ask the uh, person in charge of retail who runs and is responsible for all the Deepwood releases or all the parties anyway. Like, there's no way she's gonna want me to go <laughs> and be absentee. Um, during this and then even she Meg Rudledge said oh that sounds awesome you should totally do it let's figure out a way to make it happen 
So I reached out to uh, my friend Kenny Ichimaru and I said, hey, I've, I've got four weeks I'm willing to give. Do you think your friends at that winery would have me? Um, you know, you can let them know I'm, I'm a fermentation uh, professional. You know, I'm not just a, not just a curious person off the street who's going to be a liability. Uh, at least we hope. <laughs> um, and, uh, I heard back almost immediately that it was, it was a go and they were going to let me live at the winery for four weeks, uh, during the next harvest. And was that the, <clears throat> the desire to, to do that? Was it just happenstance by your partner mentoring it, mentioning it, or was it something that that you have a love for wine or the, the, the wood that's involved with wine, that just the fermentation process of it. Like what, what drew you to a winery versus uh, any other beverage? Uh, yeah, I think knowing that it was a possibility was definitely the seed, uh, that, uh, you know, got me to think about it as a possibility, even a, a remote one at mm-hmm. that. Um, and, you know, I, I could feel myself gaining traction uh, as far as my ability to control what was happening in our wood cellar. Uh, I was feeling more and more confident. Um, but you know, Revolution is the first and only brewery I've ever worked for. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yes, I've seen them grow from, you know, a, just a brew pub. And I don't want to say just a brew pub. It was an amazing brew pub. Um, but I've, I've watched them go from a very busy brew pub all the way up to the largest independent brewer in the state of Illinois. And we've been the largest independent brewer in the state of Illinois for like 13 years now. Um, but I was there for every step, um, you know, since shortly after we opened. Uh, so I have seen a lot at Mm -hmm. revolution, both longitudinally and, you know, through our growth. Um, but I've also, you know, as we grew, became more specialized and more focused, uh, just on barrels, uh, which was a blessing and a curse um, until sabbatical. And I was able to uh, work at the winery and, and see how uh, another industry handles fermentation and cellaring and blending and that sort of thing. Um, and also I just, you know, I wanted to immerse myself in something and just kind of scrub off, um, you know, uh, some of the, the negative experiences and feelings that I was living with at the time. Um uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I went back last year for a, another year uh, or another week of, uh, of harvest. It was absolutely ridiculous. Normally it's about a 11 week harvest for them. And we got probably 70% of the harvest done in eight days. Um, I was very happy to leave the winery <laughs> <laughs> after my week, uh, uh, last, uh, November. It was a very uh, bizarre grow year uh, for for Central Coast grapes. Um, you know, they got a lot of rain, so uh, their drought conditions had been alleviated by like three storms. It was incredible, um, but the fruit was very late uh, mm-hmm. coming in from the the vineyards. Um, so it was all backloaded. We had to get all the fruit harvested and processed before it rained again, because uh, then it was going to be too cold. Um, and the grapes were not going to recover. So it was like harvest everything right now. Uh, it was gangbusters, valuable experience, but, uh, yeah, I mean, and I, I just love those folks. I mean, they, they treat me like family. They, they took me in, uh, you know, and, and I was a son and a brother to them, um, you know, by my second day there. Um, I can't say enough good things about the the folks at Herman story and, uh, their, their sister winery, uh, or maybe even spousal winery, uh, called Desperado, which is run by, uh, Russell, Russell P. Frome, uh, owns and operates. He's the winemaker for Herman story. And his wife, Alia is, uh, the same at, uh, Desperado wines in the next town over called Templeton. Huh. Uh, but they are two of the just most lovely humans, uh, I've ever come across. Yeah. Following you on Instagram, it looks like it's a blast and a, a good time. So and pictures are beautiful. Oh yeah. The hiking pictures and the winery pictures. <laughs> yeah. They've got, they've got those things in abundance out there. Uh, it's, it's pretty silly. Uh, uh, just how beautiful and, uh, what a, what a high quality life you can have. Um, if you're just not too uptight, mm-hmm. uh, you, you gotta be a little bit laid back to, to be out there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's an incredible community and, uh, it's probably the, the, the most valuable addition to my life in the, in the last several years. Uh, 
That's uh, awesome to hear. And I know that this uh, last year you didn't just stop at Herman's story, but you stopped at, and I'm probably going to butcher this, Tonalari O barrels. Yeah, I mean, I, I butcher it too. I, I, among their uh, employees, I've I've heard it <laughs> pronounced a, a number of ways. Um, you know, as long as I'm not in front of any of them, I'm sorry if you're listening, I just <laughs> say like Tonalari O. Yeah, um, okay. I think the accent might be, you know, on the first end, Tonellario or something like that. I'm sorry, but they have uh, uh, they're a cooperage out of uh, Benicia, uh, California, which is a Bay Area. It's uh, just a, a short trip northeast of San Francisco, um, and if memory serves, it's probably half hour, forty five minutes due east of Napa. And uh, they are a predominantly French oak wine barrel cooperage, uh, Portuguese owned, uh, but American operated. And um, they have a subsidiary company uh, called Creative Oak. And uh, Creative Oak specializes in um, barrel alternatives. Um, and, you know, a lot of people make barrel alternatives. This is, you know, uh, supposed to be barrel wood that's just not a barrel that you can add to a barrel or a tank or something like that. Um, and this is not like calling up a, a typical uh, supply group and saying, hey, can I have a bag of French oak chips um, where you don't necessarily know the origin of it and maybe your options are, you know, a couple of different toasting profiles. Perfectly good stuff, mind you. Um, but Creative Oak takes it uh, an order of a magnitude up in uh, complexity and customization you can get uh, you know i'm fine i'm very fond recently in the last couple of years of using these single forest examples of french oak uh, jupy and fontainebleau and trance um, you know these are some of the most storied french oaks uh, in the winemaking world and uh, you know several thousand dollars to purchase a barrel uh, in most cases you got to buy a lot before they're less than like two grand. Um, mm. And that's unobtainium to most brewers um, because you know, there's no spirit in the barrels. So unless you're making a wild beer, uh, a virgin French oak barrel is a huge investment and an even bigger risk. Um, but their products uh, you can add to a tank or you can add to an existing barrel. Um, and it's all either hand fire toasted, uh, you know, they've got these wild proprietary toast profiles. They also have these big convection ovens that they'll put the staves in. Uh, and they'll, you know, you can order oak that's toasted in such a way that it maximizes vanilla or coconut or spicy notes or like butter for, you know, wine, you know, um, or you can get these single origin French oaks, or you can get combinations where uh, it's supposed to be like creme brulee or mocha or something like that. Um, and it's just super controllable. Um, I, I should say I, I do have a partnership with them, but not a commission. So, uh, <laughs> you know, full disclosure, uh, I am working with them. Uh, but the uh, the goal is to introduce them to the beer world as much as introduce the beer world to them. Uh, because they're just such a, a fantastic tool and I'd love nothing more than to see um, a whole lot of brewers embrace this um, you know and it's kind of selfishly you know I, I want to see one of the things I want for the Deepwood program uh, to go back to that is I want to incur I want to inspire other brewers um, to embrace traditional methods and make clean balanced nuanced complex unique beers um, that are you know not too expensive or troublesome to make, um, but they taste very troublesome to make. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Creative Oak is a fantastic tool, and uh, we're only going to be using them a whole lot more uh, at Rev. And not just in the uh, the Deepwood series. We did a uh, we're sipping right now on uh, Goldfinger's Oak Original Lager, which is a collaboration uh, that we did with Goldfinger and Downers Grove last fall, um, where we added. Uh, some jupe forest uh, oak to a keg and pasteurized it uh, in an oven uh, in the keg and then we filled it with his immaculate original lager Hellas mm -hmm. um, and then lagered it 
uh, in a cooler on this single origin French oak for a number of months and then blended that down to the appropriate intensity. Um, and that was the, that was my favorite beer that I drank last year. Um, yeah. so, I mean, the oak is not just for big, dumb beers, Yeah, you know, uh, there's a way that you can, with a deft hand, uh, achieve nuance and balance, uh, without oxidizing a, a traditional German lager, um, and without taking up a whole bunch of tank space to do the extraction, um, you know, I would encourage anybody hit me up. If you think there's a beer that you want wood in, but you don't know how to do it, or you're afraid that there's no good way to do it without, uh, disrespecting your beer, please hit me up. Um, uh, cause I would love to see you make, um, woody beers, uh, that are still balanced and respect the, the base beer and tradition. And <clears throat> drinking this, I do feel like, um, I don't know if it's power of suggestion because we've been talking about the tannins and the hydrophobia, but I do feel like at the end, at the end sip that I get a lot of that. Yeah. It's, it's the, like a, a dryness, but you taste, yeah, the wood and everything. Yeah. You just, you need that next sip, yeah. you know, it finishes and you're just like, okay, I want more right yeah. now. I love it. I just, I loved uh, doing the research and stuff. I just loved the idea that you're so committed to, wood and beer and everything like that that you were even doing the cooperage and making the barrels and just how deep your curiosity runs with it and it's not just like a surface like oh yeah i do this because it tastes good you know like there's there's more behind it yeah uh, and speaking of things behind it the the rest of the brew team you know they're they're carrying you know the the work production the fermentation uh, clarification, uh, they're keeping all of that off of my plate. So I'm really just focusing, uh, that and aforementioned Victor, uh, they're keeping a lot of that off my plate. So my, my focus has become increasingly narrow over the years. Um, but that just means it's more opportunity for me to go deeper into that narrow focus. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's become a passion of mine. Um, and, you know, if, if I get to keep making alcohol and drinking alcohol and playing with wood and seeing wineries and cooperages and traveling, um, you know, it's, it's the dream. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I want to jump into one more trip before we, and highlight a, another partnership that I know that you, you enjoy, but the coffee partnership and your trip to Guatemala. Oh yeah. Uh, just, I want to touch on that briefly before we, we continue back into the, the wood. Yeah, um, so we're partner uh, Revolution uh, partners with Dark Matter Coffee here in Chicago. Uh, cafe Deeth is always Dark Matter, super massive. Cafe is just a shitload more Dark Matter, um, super massive, even more. Uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll save that for uh, another conversation. Uh, so the first week of January in twenty three, Josh Deeth and I were invited to accompany. Uh, Jesse Diaz or Jay, uh, owner, uh, founder of uh, Dark Matter, and uh, his right hand, Aaron Campos. We were invited to go down to Origin uh, at uh, Finca San Geronimo Miramar in on the west coast of Guatemala. Uh, we were there, um, you know, on the surface. Yeah, we buy a, a ton of coffee. You know, and they, uh, we we get along so well with uh, with everybody over at Dark Matter. Uh, but we were there to advise on a couple of experimental fermentations. Uh, so coffee is grown, uh, and then, you know, it, it, the bean is grown inside a piece of fruit, uh, the cherry as it's called. Um, and then it needs to be fermented to stabilize it. Uh, now you can leave the fruit on the berry or on the bean rather, uh, and there's more to ferment. So there's more fermentation, which means there's more acidification as a result. Um, and that's where you get your fruity, high acid, bright coffees. Um, conversely, you can remove most or all of that fruit and you have what's called a washed process. And they have this beautiful uh, water supply uh, flowing through a, a, a dormant volcanic lake and it flows through the mountain and then down the other side uh, and they have like 50% total dissolved solids. If you know water chemistry, that is just unheard of for just a, a flowing stream. Um, so they can wash uh, their coffees without spending water. They just have more water than anybody knows what to do with. Mm. Um, so they, they use the that water to, to rinse the coffees and then 
do their little micro fermentation before their patio dried and then they're shelf stable. Then they can be sent all over the world and roasted and you've got your fresh coffee. So we were down there to uh, see um, this. <sighs> yeah, I, I struggle to, to come up with uh, the right superlative uh, for <laughs> uh, just how beautiful uh, this place is. Um, the property is, is like 4,500 acres and 4,500 vertical feet up a dormant volcano overlooking a valley with the Pacific Ocean to your right and Central America's most active volcano, Fuego, um, just across the valley uh, a few dozen miles away. And you're just watching plumes of smoke come out of Fuego and um, you know walk in the fields. And uh, down in the fermentation pits, you know, we were, you know, advising, well, if, if you want to do this experimental, they want to do a, a, like a dry hopped fermentation with Nelson Salvian hops and champagne yeast. Uh, so we advised them kind of in a rough and tumble way, like, okay, well, here's how we want to propagate the yeast. Here's how we want to accentuate the fermentations. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to be naturally fermented. Um, so by selecting an inoculum a, a yeast strain um you know we we showed them how to um you know how we would approach a fermentation as brewers and uh yeah so we spent a week down there tending to these fermentations and taking gravity samples and telling them what they could do next time with a little bit more planning and you know other yeasts that are you know uh employed by winemakers like a, a yeast that i learned about uh in paso robles uh, just a few months prior uh, they've since employed that uh, yeast on another experimental fermentation. Um, so yeah, I got to see you know fermentation in a winery, and a few months later, fermentation on a volcano in, yeah. in Guatemala, um, and it uh, really opened my eyes. Uh, and just a, a super pleasant, and enjoyable trip. Um, you know, drinking a ton of Guatemalan lager. Um, and I brought some wine and, um, you know, if you know, the, the dark matter boys, we were getting into all manner of uh, good times. I'll leave it at that. That's awesome. All right. So that leads us to the, the next section. I wanted to talk about you have recently, I think just at the end of last year, started a company uh, called barrel ponics. And, um, if this last, however long we've been talking, isn't enough to like sell you on this, your your concept is to um, advise, or, and I'll, I'll actually let me like I'll let you explain it. Go ahead. <laughs> ah, thanks. Yeah, so Barrel Ponics uh, is quite simply it's a it's a consulting firm, uh, and it's just me. Um, but Barrel Ponics is partnered with Creative Oak and Tonelary O. That is my wood partner, uh, not in the barrel world. And then, uh, like I said, Midwest Barrel is my barrel partner. Um, you know, so I'll work at conferences as a consultant. So I went to Portland for CiderCon with Midwest Barrel uh, a few months back. Uh, I'm about to go to Vegas for Craft Brewers Conference and kind of work for both uh, Midwest and Creative Oak, uh, just advising brewers, uh, you know, how, why they should use these suppliers uh, and how to go about maximizing the value of their products. Um, also helping brewers, uh, get top dollar for their spent barrels. Barrels are getting more expensive for everybody across the board. Even if you're buying your barrels directly from a distillery, um, you know, it's something that every wood seller operator, uh, is painfully aware of right now is that prices have gone through the roof. Um, so if you can get more money, uh, for your spent barrels, you know, basically reducing your overall barrel costs. And that's never been more important than it is now. Um, and then, uh, I'm open for collaborations as well. Um, you know, revolution will have first writer refusal for any collab that I want to do. Um, and if it doesn't fit in with what we're trying to do at rev, um, then I'll pursue it on my own and barrel ponics will do a, a collab with another entity. Um, that could be designing beers. It could be sharing the cost of the raw materials, networking, you know, anything, um, you know, most collaborations are just, you know, your friends come over to your brewery and eat pizza and drink beer while you make beer. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. We, we dig doing that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm barrel ponics is just committed to 
making the wood sellerman's life easier and their businesses more prosperous, give them more control, reduce their risks. Um, you know, in short, I want to help uh, a brewery uh, economize or weaponize in the case of an established operation uh, or uh, a younger operation or a startup. Uh, I'd like to help you skip over that first 10 years or so of awkward experimentation um, where batch one you're going to be hopefully releasing um, a product that is what i think are the the four sexiest words in the industry is as the brewer intended Mm -hmm. Um, so skip over all that destroyed beer uh, all that heartache of do we destroy this beer or do we release it and risk alienating our fans Um, yeah open for business i want uh, i want the level of uh, of wood aged beer across the board to, to come up. Um, and, uh, I'm fortunate enough that I've got the, the perspectives and the experience that I pretty sure I can do that for just about anybody. And the, yeah, the experience, but, and then, uh, the partnerships as well. Like you, you're obviously a wealth of knowledge on this uh, topic and, um, that experimental aspect of uh, working with what was the tunnel area company? Creative, Oak. creative Oak. Yeah. That, like that just uh, sort of like opens a whole nother realm that I think I don't know how many brewers across the country are even aware of. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you look at their literature and their website right now, uh, Creative Oak doesn't even mention beer. They talk about wines uh, and introducing the proof collection for distillers. Uh, but beer isn't even mentioned. Like it's brand new to them as well. Yeah. Um, so this this first year, 2024, is kind of like the handshake between Barrelponics and uh, Tonalario Creative Oak. Uh, it's a it's a low risk feeling out. You know, there's no commission involved. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just kind of getting to know each other this year, um, and then we're we're going to be a little bit more targeted going forward, it, provided both parties want to continue. Yeah. Um, but like uh, going back to like Creative Oak, when uh, when the Deepwood series releases like a vanilla deeth or a coconut deeth or something like that. Um, rather than just adding the same adjuncts that everybody else adds, we're going to start by adding coconut oak or vanilla oak to our whiskey barrels to get as much oak derived vanilla, coconut, you name it, uh, as possible as a base. And then you'll find that you will require less of the truly expensive Mm -hmm. adjuncts. And you also, when you have oak derived vanilla and vanilla bean derived vanilla, not only do you have to buy a lot less actual vanilla, uh, but there's so much more complexity and nuance uh, and depth to that character. Um, and you just set yourself apart from everybody else who's just going ape with dosing rates of these uh, really potent and expensive adjuncts. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can't plug them enough. Yeah, and I, I noticed that, um, <clears throat> jumping back to the uh, Midwest Barrel Company, when you got when you were out there at CiderCon, they had the opportunity where people were able to sign up for like a one-on-one discussion. Um, assuming maybe it'll be the same when you're out in Vegas, just as like a, a heads up for people who may be listening. Um, yeah, I don't know if uh, if they're planning on uh, you know having the the registration form. I don't know if it was a Google Sheet or, or how they did it, but um, yeah, people were able to sign up for like a, a scheduled one-on-one with me. Uh, we haven't talked to the specifics for. Uh, CBC Vegas but uh, if you would like to talk to me um, please come uh, see me at the Midwest Barrel booth I don't have their booth number offhand yeah. but uh, they'll be easy enough to find um, and uh, yeah I'll, I'll be there on the convention floor uh, for most of the week I uh, won't be going to any seminars or anything like that um, so between seminars or you know, during lunch or something like that. If you have any questions, come on down. Uh, you won't get an invoice unless we decide to, yeah. you know, take on a big project and I've got to come out to your brewery or something. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's so many things we can do and I can help you out. Uh, yeah, if it, if it involves liquid and, and wood, um, yeah, give me a, give me a shout and, uh, we'll see if, uh, if we can make your lives and jobs easier. Yeah, and so uh, if somebody's not able to get there, I know that on Instagram it is at Barrel Ponics, which is P O N I X. Yes. And um, 
the, is, is there an email that you want to throw out? Uh, there? yeah, I'm uh, Marty at barrelponics.com and it's yeah, barrel, how barrel is spelled and then ponix P O N I X. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just like ponix, just like hydroponics or aeroponics. Um, yep. ponix is Latin for to work or to toil. Um, so it's barrel work. Um, uh, but, uh, the nix is kind of like, you know, to nix something. So we're eliminating the work and the toil. Um, so it's a little Easter egg, uh, hidden there in the name. Mostly the X is just there to be edgy. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And I love the, uh, the saying or the lo- the slogan, the stellar and the seller. Yes. That, uh, I have to thank my designers uh, for that. That's, uh, Joey and Sarah Potts out in Indianapolis, um, with guide and anchor, uh, is their design firm. Um, I, my original tagline was interstellar process design. Uh, and, uh, when I got the, you know, the options for my logo, they had changed the tagline to stellar in the seller. And I was like, well, that's, that's sorted. There's an improvement. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we've, we've got, uh, Joey and Sarah at guide and anchor to, to thank for that. And if you have any design needs, um, they are young and hip smart and, uh, sweet as two pies. Um, I have to encourage anybody who needs some, uh, business design work, uh, please seek them out. Yeah, very good. And, um, I will, Obviously, I'll have the, the links to to um, the different Instagram accounts for you as well. Is there anywhere else that you want people to be able to find you? Revolution Brewing, uh, the tap room, 3340 North Kedzie Avenue. Come on by whether we're uh, releasing beer or not. Um, you know, on a release day, I'm, I'm unless I'm traveling, I'm definitely going to be there uh, for as long as I've got the legs on yeah. me. Um, I can attest that I have picked up beer from you before <laughs> at, the, at the little table so i can uh, i can attest to that um so i, I just wanted to, to shout out because this is i my focus is music and beer i just loved uh and you mentioned this earlier but you have a lot of beer and music references in some of the the beers that you guys make but the iggy pop and the stooges references the mm-hmm. fifth city blew my mind when you i heard you mention it. that was a loretta lynn song and yeah. now that's like on my liked song playlist <laughs> oh, nice yeah it's so good. Like my I grew up listening to country music, and my my dad's side's from West Virginia, so I I love that. Um, and then uh, is Van Halen Friday still a thing? Van Halen Friday is a thing, and I don't even have to cue it up anymore. It just uh, just happens. They, they know <laughs> they know to do it. Um, and if somebody puts on like a rock and roll playlist in midweek, and Van Halen comes on, uh, usually someone is there to skip the song because we it's like it's not Friday. We don't get to listen to Van Halen. It's yeah. like coffee is for closers. Uh, it's like Van Halen is for Fridays. Uh, we don't want anybody getting Friday vibes on a Tuesday. And you're like, oh, it's Van Halen, but I have to come to work three more days this week. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, is there anything else you'd like to add before we get to the outro questions? No, I, th- I think you've done such an amazing job with the with the research and going back. I really appreciate uh, the the quality of, uh, of the questions as well as... Um, how varied they are. I mean, you, you really covered a, a lot of ground. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope it's as fun to listen to as it has been to record it. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's been, it's been awesome. And I've, uh, been able to get out everything out there and you've been very helpful with, <laughs> with leading the conversation. So I appreciate that also. All right. So let's jump to the outro questions. Number one, favorite beverage doesn't have to be alcoholic. Hellas. Hellas. Do you have a particular brewery that you like their Hellas the most? Right now, Goldfinger. Goldfinger. All right, very good. I mean, Dove, Dovetail does an amazing job as well. Uh, Metro was was kicking butt as well, but uh, I got to go with uh, Goldfinger. Tom yeah. and Jeremy are just, they're killing it. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. If anyone out there has not had any Goldfinger, I haven't made it out there yet. I, I need to, it's a little bit of a hike from the city, but I need to get out there. But I, I, I do grab their stuff in the, and I see it in the stores here. All right, number two, a song everyone should listen to. Inca Roads by Frank Zappa. Uh, the studio version uh, from One Size Fits All is uh, fantastic, and it's a good place to start. But my favorite uh, is featured on the uh, 1973 live Roxy by Proxy. I'll have to see which one I can find to add to the playlist. <laughs> yeah, you just have to listen to like all dozen live versions of it to pick your favorite one. But uh, they're, they're all great. It's just uh, totally mad song uh yeah he he and everyone else and they were just 
absolute geniuses. I was expecting either a Van Halen or a Motorhead song, but you don't be for a loop there, but I like it. <laughs> uh, that's a shout out. Uh, uh, Inca Roads was a song that was shown to me by uh, a mentor of mine, Jeffords Richardson, uh, former director of Firestone Barrel Works, now, oh. now retired. Uh, I spent some time with him on sabbatical and he showed me that song and I've been obsessed with it ever since. Awesome. Yeah, I meant to, I usually ask people who their mentors are, but we've talked so much about Seaback and Josh Deeth. I figured that was going to be the answer, but I'm glad you got a, another extra one in there. Oh, yeah. What up, Jeffers? You're the best. All right. Number three, favorite concert you've been to? This one was, I had to rack my brain over, but uh, in the interest of just getting an answer out there, I'm going to say uh, when I saw Alice Cooper in Vegas at Psycho Fest uh, probably five, six years ago, um, he's one of my favorite artists. And even uh, with his tenure in the industry, uh, he just blew the doors off of that venue. He headlined a very challenging festival and, uh, you know, showed everybody exactly why he was the headliner. Just, he is still just absolutely stunning live. That's awesome. I mean, as somebody who I, 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 I don't have like that musical taste that I typically go to, but it's somebody who's such like a icon that I feel like it would be amazing to see anyways. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that he, lived up to the the hype and that that profile he is a showman he he surpassed the hype he surpassed uh surpassed my expectations uh, wildly that's awesome all right number four favorite place you've had a drink there is a spot in yosemite national park on the south rim of the valley uh overlooking yosemite valley it's just a little bit west of a spot called Taft Point um, and there is a outcrop of rocks that you can sit on and uh, right in front of you is a 3,000 foot drop uh, with a 60 mile an hour wind uh, that hits you in the face if you lean forward and you're looking across the valley um, at the Dawn Wall on El Capitan and uh, I've been there for boozy picnics uh, about half a dozen times now, and it is far and away the best place to do just about anything. That's awesome. I need to get out there. I, I love nature as, as well. It's hard to get out to the, the west, though. That's a, it's on my list of things to do is hit the, the parks out there. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, number five, guilty pleasure for music. Uh, again, uh, an interest in getting an answer out there. I'm just going to go with Randy Newman. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty you know straightforward. Like I, rock, jazz, blues, metal, classical, uh, you name it. Um, I'm not really ashamed of of anything. I don't listen right. to top forty, uh, and I don't listen to to modern country. Um, but uh, yeah, I got a soft spot for for Randy Newman. And it, boy, I I enjoy annoying my friends with uh, <laughs> with some of that stuff. That's awesome. All right. Well, that uh, wraps up the outro questions. And it's been an amazing conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, coming over here and uh, taking a shot on letting me even do this interview. So I, I really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everybody. Until next time, drink some new beer and listen to some new music. Cheers. <laughs>